information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, I'm Alistair McLeod, and I'm here on behalf of Gold Money Foundation. And today, I'm talking to Drew Mason, Drew's principal of St. Joseph Partners, based in Powley, near Philadelphia. I hope I pronounced that right, Drew. Close enough, Alistair. <laughs> uh, and uh, he off they offer advice to investors in precious metals. St. Joseph Partners is a precious metals boutique that assists clients in sourcing physical gold and silver, and platinum, I think, as well, globally. So they're wired into the physical gold and silver markets. And for those who do not know him, after graduating from Wharton, he worked for 15 years on Wall Street in institutional equities for what is today UBS and then Credit and Suisse and Barclays before following his personal investment choices and pursuing a full-time focus in precious metals. Drew also publishes articles in Forbes magazine which published an interesting piece by him a few days ago, suggesting that companies might in the future allocate some of their cash reserves to precious metals as directors wake up to the risk of their cash balances being entirely held in paper money. Drew, welcome to this podcast. Thank you so much, Alistair. Well, thank you for being with us. Tell us a little bit about uh, St. Joseph Partners, and have I done them justice in my intro? And, uh, and who are your typical customers? Absolutely. Thank you so much. So as you mentioned, we are headquartered in the U.S. We're named after one of history's oldest recorded gold custodians who 2,000 years ago saw that government in his day was also more concerned about job security than its citizens and who used gold to protect his family, particularly on their trek into Africa. And we work with investors, as you described, from a brokerage perspective, uh, helping them to diversify into gold and silver and the other precious metals. Also via uh, diversified storage options for them below many radar screens. And for accredited investors, we help them with funds that make it easy to get differentiated exposure to metals versus proxies such as ETFs or futures or options. Well, that's interesting because, of course, there is a big debate about uh, ETFs and, and, and so on. Um, but uh, what do you tell your clients against, uh, about gold and silver as an asset class compared with other portfolio assets? It may be hard for non-U.S. investors to believe, particularly Asian investors. But generally in the U.S., even today, there remains a complete lack of awareness as to why physical gold and silver are attractive elements of one's portfolio. Far too many investors still believe the only reason to own gold is for protection versus Armageddon. And what we step through with them is, you know, was 1913 Armageddon or 1971 or 1980 or 2000? Obviously, in hindsight, they weren't. But when we look back to dates such as those, we see how critical inflection points in inflation were to protecting growth and protecting wealth and growing investments. In those instances where we saw inflation tick higher, precious metals not only retained wealth, but became strong relative performers. And as we step people through this reality, when you, if you were to price gold in dollars, I think you would conclude the early 70s are a period with many similarities to today. In America, social spending programs were essentially out of control. America was financing a war and our government, the American government, lost control of its debts. And the printing that ensued during that decade saw the valuation of the S&P index, our primary stock market, compressed by half as multiples contracted from 15 to eight times and bonds became a bloodbath. And really, why wouldn't one expect that to happen because at the end of the day, as I'm sure you and most of your listeners know, Alistair, valuing a stock is simply discounting the cash flows one would expect to derive from an enterprise over time. And the most important input in that calculation is the discount rate. Ditto for bonds. And since gold and silver thrive with inflation, the metals perform in an opposite fashion. 
and the 70s witnessed gold move by more than 20-fold. So I think if one thinks through the rationale for how gold and silver are uniquely diversified uh, assets to tuck into a portfolio, especially today as we sit here at the end of a 30-year cycle with declining rates that are as essentially as low as they can go. We've just witnessed bond issuance hit an all-time high in the first quarter. And with the reality that history says paper currencies, unfortunately, simply do not preserve wealth, to us, it seems a prudent allocation that something greater than 0% is a better uh, way to protect oneself than having no gold at all. I'm sure that's 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 right, and uh, certainly you know, anyone who has missed out on the rise so far, I think, must be kicking themselves in in just purely in terms of profit and loss. Um, your your comparison with the 1970s is interesting uh, yeah. on all sorts of levels. Um, firstly, I remember in the 1970s the average portfolio exposure was probably in the order of something like five to ten percent gold for a typical portfolio, whereas nowadays it's less than 1%, and that is after an enormous rise in, um, uh, in the price of gold. So um, in that sense, perhaps we haven't um, really started, uh, <laughs> if you like. The other thing I did, which was quite interesting, was I put together a, um, a chart on the relationship between uh, the amount of gold that um, uh, the uh, Fed says it has, or the U.S. Treasury has, and the true money supply, and the relationship seemed to bottom out, whereby um, the amount of gold held was roughly two and a half percent of the outstanding true money supply. Um, it bottomed out like that in the late 60s and into the early 70s, and it's been like that really from about um, 1999 to 2006. So um, there are, as you say, I think some considerable similarities. So that I think is a, is a very, very interesting point. Um, do you find that against this background there is a sort of growing interest in the case for gold and silver or is it still very hard work persuading investors? Many days, Alistair, I feel like I need therapy after speaking to institutional <laughs> investors given how negatively they view it. And as we sit here today in early 2012, we're getting numerous confirmations that interest is very low, indeed at multi-year lows. From the paper market's perspective, you have just seen prints from Holbert's index showing that bullish gold investors are back near the 2008 lows. Allocations to gold within sector fund complexes, such as the Ridex group, are back to their 2003 lows. The COMEX uh, reduction in bullish positions is back towards its 2004 lows. And in the physical markets, the U.S. Mint said a few weeks ago that gold demand is now at a five-year low. In the case of silver, sentiment is also extremely low, and we sit with a price that's still 40% below the prior cycle peak dating back to 1980, making silver truly an outlier compared to other physical assets. So with both gold and silver, from a short-term perspective, um, there is minimal interest, and I think we probably are closer to uh, seller exhaustion than uh, euphoria. Now, thinking about it from a longer-term perspective, which is how we encourage clients to consider the metals, as you referenced a moment ago, we also perceive the metals to be very under-owned. Dovetailing with your point, virtually every investment bank study that we see concludes gold is barely 1% of global wealth, and silver is well less than 1 100th of 1% 1 of really? global wealth. Yeah. And when we talk to primarily U.S. financial advisors across the board, they can see that mirrors their books of business in terms of how their accounts are allocated. So there's this perception that gold is a crowded trade because, again, speaking with a from an American perspective, 
here there's just a barrage of doomsday ads coming at investors on radio and TV from gold sales firms. But the data doesn't corroborate that those large uh, ad budgets are translating into large allocations. But it does also, Alistair, just bring up the larger question that you segued into, and that is, you know, people feel like perhaps they've missed the run. And where are we? Because obviously, I cannot guarantee that gold is going to go higher. It very well could be at a peak. But I thought Barry Kitt framed this argument very well by working through a 10% allocation. As Barry observed, if all of the concerns that I think you and I and many of your listeners have proved to be too bearish, and we shortly enter into a period of global economic renaissance where growth uh, comes back, employment surges, deficit surpluses um, look so much better and debt is reduced, then gold will get crushed. But let's say it trades down as much as 50% on what would be wonderful news of all those positive economic factors. That would be a price point below the cost to extract gold from the ground in most jurisdictions. But again, just keeping the math simple, we'll say it trades down 50%. Investors with a 10% allocation to gold will not at all be heartbroken to see that because their relative excuse me, their net portfolio will expand in value probably by 20%, if not more, because the other 90% of their assets will appreciate so considerably. But if at the other end of the spectrum, if governments cannot come up with a magic bullet to solve these intimidating problems that are before us, then the views of people such as your James Turk, whose views have been right on the mark this cycle, will likely play out and we may see gold go to 8,000 an ounce. In that scenario, you probably will see stocks and other assets compressed by about half. But again, the net effect and purchasing power for that portfolio will be that it will have been maintained. So from end to end of the spectrum, I think there's very clear reason to conclude that having an allocation to gold is significant whether we have peaked or not, just from a risk management perspective. Yes, I think think that does make sense. Um, I was interested in in your analysis there because uh, the people you talk to, I think, take a a very, um, if you like, American view insofar as the drivers for the price of gold now, I don't think at the moment are... In domestic America, I think it's abroad. It's places like China and uh, and India. Well, it's always been India because they've always had enormous demand for gold. But the Chinese, in particular, have now entered the scene, and uh, they're big geopolitical games. I think with the central banks over there and elsewhere in Asia uh, um, acquiring gold. I mean, do, do, when, when you talk to people there, do you find that they're aware of what's going on outside America or are they very sort of introspective in that sense? I think that we are still far too introspective as a country and don't realize the effects of some of our policies as obvious as they should be to us at this point in time. And I think your point is right on the mark. And really what we're speaking about here is that we don't have just a one, uh, one driver behind the gold story here, but we have multiple drivers. We have the new global demand that was not present in the last cycle, as you described from China. And think about the significance of the Chinese government encouraging its citizens, you know, doing the about face that they did to go out and save in physical gold and silver. That is not something that they did shooting from the hip that is a policy born of enormous conviction that gold and silver will have long-term value and wealth preservation. And so that is the driver, that is a major driver for it, along with the concurrent debasement of virtually all Western currencies at this point in time. Um, From the supply side as well, Alistair, I think it's extremely attractive because 
we have a constrained um, production here. We've seen CapEx nearly triple over yes. the last 10 years, and we really can't get gold supply to budge. True, silver has gone from 500 million to 800 million ounces, but in the scheme of things, even if it doubles from here, it's not going to be a percent of global wealth. So the supply side is very attractive. And by our work, as you may have seen from some of our writings, we quantify that fully 20% of the supply numbers that are cited in the public are really nothing more than academia because they are, the supplies are coming from China and from Venezuela and from other jurisdictions that, such as Uzbekistan, which is a top 10 producer of gold, that do not allow the export of gold. Yes, they're sitting on their own gold, aren't they? they're, they're that's, um, So you've got to cut the total amount, as you say, of, it's what, about 2,500 tons a year? Um, you've got to knock 20% off that. Approximately, that's yeah. it. That, yes, exactly. So from the supply side, um, and, and, and the supply side, you know, there's so many things we could talk about, Alistair, but in a world where governments are increasing their reach into corporations through higher taxes, higher regulatory costs, that is also changing the risk-reward dynamic with as corporations do their net present value calculations on incremental projects. And I think we're seeing in certain jurisdictions, corporations decide to scale back um, some of their plans because at the end of the day, many of these projects are built on a handshake and with the substantive change in tax policy, um, the economics of a project look very different. So we think you have all that supporting it. And we haven't even mentioned the demand drivers coming um, as you alluded to from corporations, which today own essentially zero gold. And we had looked at a case where if seven companies from the S&P 500, our domestic proxy for the stock market, were to allocate towards gold, and granted, these are seven large cash-rich companies. Yeah. Um, so I, what I'm interested from what you're saying is I, I'm not quite sure whether, in your experience, people in America are still very worried about the future um, are, or whether after the Lehman crisis, are they now less concerned? Um, I mean, you were sort of suggesting, I think, that people are perhaps less concerned, um, you know, there's some economic recovery going and, and so on. So um, there's less, if you like, pressure for people to look at protection by buying gold. Um, what, what's your view on that? Are people still very worried about the future, the future for the economy? I think you are right that people are less concerned. Recently, there have been strong headlines suggesting the U.S. is in the midst of a, uh, a promising economic recovery. Personally, I think those headlines will prove to have been um, misfires. And I think if you consider gold demand as a measure of concern about the status quo, by definition, the metrics we just have been speaking about with us being here at multi-year lows are indicative of complacency. And it's fascinating to consider how we've gotten to this point when you think about the last decade where we have gone from the internet where people's perspective was all in. I want to have the opportunity to make money and I'm willing to risk all my capital to get that opportunity. When the internet bubble burst, we began seeing that pendulum of investor appetite swinging from what I believe will likely be seen as the zenith during our lifetimes of all-in risk appetite to a more conservative posture. And the early manifestations of that, I think, were real estate where we saw people saying with their wallets, at least this won't go to zero like my dot-coms did. Real estate will always be worth something. But then as the credit bubble burst in 06, it became... Um, painfully apparent to people again that like all assets, real estate um, has some cyclicality to it. And what we witnessed then was people saying, well, what is safe? And their financial advisors and the business school textbooks 
showed them a convenient little matrix that said bonds are safer than stocks and cash is safer than bonds. And we have seen this, I would characterize almost a window dressing type allocation shift um, by people who are perce- perceiving, and you know, really, I, I apologize, window dressing isn't the right term for that, but we have seen a superficial, I would say, allocation uh, of people from stocks into bonds perceiving that they are extremely safe when again we have strong historical precedent that says in periods of rising inflation bonds are not indeed safe and we have strong evidence through history saying that paper currencies are not safe so at some point um, something's going to happen i think we're in the early stages of it with bonds coming off their peaks with all-time low yields people will again return to the question, well, what really is safe? And I think this time they will have a newfound appreciation for financial history, which has been completely absent from even American business schools. And they will see quickly that history says over time, gold and silver stand head and shoulders above other assets in terms of providing liquid wealth protection. Yes, that, 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 that is interesting because um, I know that there's one chart that's, that James Turk is very keen, keen on, which he has in his slide presentation of the price of oil uh, against gold, which really since the 60s has hardly moved. I mean, there's been volatility, but um, uh, the, the price of oil um, in terms of barrels per uh, ounces of gold is exactly the same as it was <laughs> 40, 50 years ago. So, um, tell me, do you find it um, easy or difficult to get hold of physical metal uh, for your clients? Well, given what is transpiring, I think it's surprisingly easy. It has been interesting to see how premiums to convert from paper currency or even paper gold into physical gold have varied from region to region, where the costs are frequently higher to do so in Asia than the U.S., but... This, I think, is another indicator as to how slack demand is and is helping to contribute to the relative ease to acquire um, premiums. We've actually, to acquire physicals, we've actually seen international investors sourcing metals from the U.S. and shipping it to Europe and Asia. And given the lack of premiums here in the U.S., interestingly, to Americans, they are shocked to find that today, despite our problems, the premiums to convert into physical metals are near the record tights despite what is going on and when you you don't have to look far back in history to see how those premiums were much wider and it was much more difficult as recently as 2008 when stress last manifested itself our work shows that the premium to convert into the most widely traded gold species is more than double what it is today and the cost to convert into similar silver product was more than fivefold today's levels. And I think this goes back to the simple reality that if gold is just 1% of wealth and the amount of gold money is only 1% to 10% of that amount, it doesn't take much of a swing in sentiment for uh, metal supplies to tighten. As Hathaway said, it is likely comparable to trying to get the Hoover Dam through a garden hose. But today, <laughs> thankfully, both metals are very available. Well, um, uh, Drew, that has really been uh, fascinating, and thank you very much indeed for taking time to speak to me. Um, tell me, uh, your website, I think, is St. Joseph USA, or one word, dot com. Is that, is that where listeners can find you? That's correct. Thank you. It's ST. J-O-S-E-P-H-U-S-A dot com. Excellent. Well, Drew, thank you very much again. And uh, it's been very much my pleasure. And uh, we will follow this with interest. And uh, particularly, I was interested in uh, the suggestion that company treasurers start, should start looking at um, uh, maybe diversifying out of paper money into, into uh, precious metals. And I think that probably will happen before this run is over. So we've still got that ahead of us. Again, Drew, thank you very much. Thank you, Alistair. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts.
from our Gold Research section.